Hi, everyone. I just, this is a super quick introduction and welcome to Timothy Dwight College. For those of you who are not familiar with us, so welcome. I hope this is one of many times you'll come back and visit us. Um, but it is my pleasure today to welcome the Jazz Collective. And to really start everything off, I'm going to introduce Eva Putman, who is current president of the collective. She's a senior at Morris. Her instruments are piano, jazz piano, and also melodica, which she tells me she does not play for <laughs> in the jazz combo, but in the, the university's marching band. So um, without any more ado, here's Eva. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, as our wonderful head of college said, we are the Yale Undergraduate Jazz Collective. We are an advocacy group that promotes jazz education and jazz events here on campus. Um, we provide subsidized lessons and we put on free events like this one for Yale and the New Haven community. For some additional information about the Jazz Collective, uh, part of our lessons program will be happening this spring. We have just extended the deadline for our subsidized lessons program. So if you're interested in applying or attending our upcoming board meeting on Monday at nine in Bath Library, uh, please reach out to me after this event or come talk to any one of us. Um, we're so grateful to be hosting our first tea of the year here at TV. Thank you so much to our wonderful head of college, Mary Lou, for having us, as well as everyone else from TD, including the college staff. Today's tea will take the form of a discussion between Larry Blumenfeld and Professor Michael Veal. Mr. Blumenfeld is a music and culture critic who writes for the Wall Street Journal and the Daily Beast. His work focuses on jazz and Afro-Latin music, as well as the intersections between jazz politics and social justice. Professor Veal is the Moses Professor of Music and African American Studies here at Yale. He studies the music and culture of Africa and the African diaspora and teaches classes on jazz history. Today's discussion will also be live streamed on Zoom. Those of you attending via Zoom are welcome to submit comments and questions at any time. We will ask them to our guests as time in the conversation permits. The recorded live stream will later be posted on Facebook and YouTube at the Yale Undergraduate Jazz Collective for those who couldn't attend. We ask that questions be kept short and respectful and held until solicited by the guests. Without further ado, please welcome Mr. Blumenfeld and Professor Beal. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Larry Blumenfeld. Uh, it's really a pleasure and honor and I'm flattered to be here and this couldn't be a more welcoming and inspired place. And thank you so much for inviting me into your home, not to mention your college. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't think of it. Well, we're not here sitting here sipping tea, but I am sitting here sipping um, hot cider, which is absolutely perfect for this day. And I can't think of anything more civilized than the idea of gathering for tea or cider and sitting together in a wood panel room and wanting to talk and think about music and about culture and how we live it and how it affects our lives, um, as opposed to just reading something I write on your computer or on your phone or downloading some tracks and listening to them on your earbuds or whatever else. So, and to me, that's, you know, a lot of what excites me about coming here and a lot of what excites me at doing the work that I do, which is I am heavily invested in the idea of music as a shared experience and a culture, whatever that might mean, that has a lot of, has great significance in every aspect of our lives. And that is why I asked Professor Veal, Michael Veal, to join me here for a conversation because I've admired his writing and his work as a scholar and a musician and I know that we share those general values. And, you know, I've come to universities and other cultural institutions and lectured. And I might come here and lecture about my work on post Katrina New Orleans or the relationship between Cuba and the US and its music. But this is more interesting in some ways. We have a conversation. And I want you to be involved in this conversation. At the end, we'll ask for questions. But I definitely want you to be involved in this conversation. I'm, a, I'm moved and inspired also by the fact that I've been invited here by the Yale Undergraduate Jazz Collective, which to me, you know, my understanding is that it grew from people sitting around a table and creating a mailing list and things grew. And there were some ideas about what was needed, what was wanted. 
some ways it reminds me a little bit of the inspiration some great musicians had in Chicago in 1965 when they created something called the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, AACM, which I think today is remains a very potent and vital source, not just for musicians, for people connected to this larger idea of culture. And the existence of this undergraduate jazz collective points to those kind of ambitions. It also points in some ways to the very curious, maybe even in battle, place that quote unquote jazz finds itself at an institution or even in this country sometimes. Um, and I think I see that as something that's interesting, not 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 more than negative. I see that as interesting. So um, I guess if it's not too boring, a place to start maybe is, I mean, and I'm interested in how you relate to this idea of jazz, this culture of jazz, whatever it may be. But how did we get drawn to this? So I'm gonna start by asking you if you can, in a short story version, how did you come to jazz or jazz come to you? Why are you putting on me to start? <laughs> oh, I am, I am. Oh, you, I, 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 can, I can give my short story. I thought yours would be better. Well, I think they're, they're equal, they're just different. I came to it. Um, was, first of all, my dad was a musician. My dad was a drummer. That's not how we made his daily bread. He was actually a microbiologist, but he, uh, but he was a committed drummer and a uh, jazz drummer. He liked to play like Art Blakey, or you know, like Miles Davis or So What, you know that song? That was his tempo. Ting, 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 ting. The old school drummers who could swing a whole room just with their ride cymbal. That's one symbol they could change the the energy in the room, the gravity in the room. And he was also uh, obsessed with so-called Latin drumming. You know, mambo music and the early south side and Latin jazz and all of that. So he'd come home from work and um, practice for two or three hours after work. That's dedication for someone with a full-time job. And I grew up in Queens in New York. And at that time, my neighborhood in Queens was it was kind of known as the music neighborhood. In other words, this is St. Albans, you know. So there were a lot of musicians, musicians. out there. And uh, I think James Brown, when he was at the height of his powers, was about five blocks in one direction from my parents' house. And then John Coltrane was about three blocks in that same direction. Um, Roy Haynes and all of his musical family and you know, Lester Young lived out there for a while, and Billy Holiday lived out there, Miles lived out there for a while. There were lots of musicians, and it seemed like there was at least a band or two on every block. Because basically, it was a middle-class neighborhood, and people could, you know, it takes money to be a musician, basically. You need money for to, to buy instruments and to maintain instruments. You need money for instruction and all of that. And so that neighbor, and the main thing is that people generally had garages. So they could go in the garage and make noise. Uh, and then my dad took our garage, which was like a two car, two car garage, and converted it into a like a professionally equipped rehearsal studio. That was when I was like 10 years old. So from that point, our house was full of musicians, you know, every day. I'd come home from school and there'd be some great musicians rehearsing there. And it was jazz, it was funk, soul, RB. You know, fusion, those were things that were, were out there in the atmosphere in the 70s. And so that's the short answer. Okay. Now, what's your answer? And you, you were playing, were you playing saxophone when all that was happening? Or no. when did that start? No, I was first playing guitar. Okay. I got to ask a question. Did you ever go to a place called Gerald's Cafe? Yeah, I remember Gerald's. Yeah. Yeah. It was the 70s, everyone wanted to play electric instruments, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was like the rhythm section people were ruling then. Then yeah. in the 80s, some more players started to fight to try to take it back. Right. But then it was taken away from everybody by the digital people. <laughs> so, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't have that kind of experience or that kind of exposure, definitely not through my dad. Um, I grew up deep in Brooklyn in a neighborhood called Canarsie. Oh, wow. And um, L train. L train and then a bus. Um, and uh, I did love music very early on. 
played some trumpet, did a lot of singing. So if I was playing trumpet, I was trying to sound like a group called Chicago, or maybe on my hippest day, trying to sound like Earth, Wind, and Fire, which I would still like to sound like, frankly. Um, singing, I would be singing <coughs> Billy Joel, or on my, hip, on my hippest day, I would be singing Stevie Wonder, which I still like to do. Um, my brother, who was a so I, my brother was a year and a half older than me. He played clarinet, sax. He went on to everything. He played all the saxes. Went on to play bassoon. Made his own reeds. But he used to listen to this radio station WRVR, which no longer exists, but was a bona fide jazz radio station back in the days when you could have jazz radio and when you could have radio. And I would I would I would kind of make fun of him. I'm like. Wait, I thought it was a saxophonist record. Why? I'm, all I'm hearing is piano here. Or I'd be like, I haven't heard, I haven't heard any. What are they playing? I hear no melody of this. I had no, I had no idea why he was listening to this music. I had no idea why that what they were doing with this music. And he had these albums by a pianist named Thelonious Monk, these LPs. And so he went away to college. Then I went away to college. And then. I started doing a lot of things that opened my mind. Some of the classes that I took, the friendships that I made, and the short story is I came back, I stole all of the Thelonious Monk albums. <laughs> and that was, and to this day, Thelonious Monk, and I understood that there was math in here, there was dance in here, there was some idea about dissonance that was so beautiful. And there was some idea of, things being out of balance that was somehow in balance. I was, and I feel the same way about that music today, but that led me on this path of, okay, I'd like hear Weather Report, who some people might call fusion, but to me, their music was far deeper than fusion. Um, and then I would go backwards and forwards in time. I, that would lead me back into a, what did Wayne Shorter play before that? And what did Miles Davis play before that? But then that would also lead me forward in time to what jazz is actually happening now in my life, which would be about the same age as you are now. And so for me, it was very interesting to, you know, I plopped in this place and I could go back and forward. And then I found myself writing about the music and like working in connection with the music. And I found myself quickly in this weird moment in the late 80s, early 90s, where now there was a record business and a lot of people who were telling you you should move only back in time and not do the move forward in time, which that, you know, if you were aware, that wasn't true of the real music scene, but there was a prevailing narrative, which confused me. You're going right for the heart of the... Um, I'm, no, I, don't mean, I don't mean this is controversy, I just mean, this is my own personal experience of what led me to have these questions. And then there was a congressional act and all this publicity and this new consciousness of jazz as America's classical music. And to me, this was very provocative too, because I'm like, first of all, what do you mean about class? Why are you calling this classical music? Why do we need to call it classical music? What do you mean by calling it classical music? But also, what America are you, you know, America's classical music? What America are we talking about here? It's not the same America as the classical people are talking about. So I don't mean that as throwing up. There was much controversy over these kinds of ideas decades ago. I'm not very invested in that controversy, but I am very invested in all the questions that my young mind started to think about in relation to this music. And, you know, I do think like, all right, at a certain level you hear music and either touch, you either like what you hear or you don't. It either touches you, your heart, or does something to your body or it doesn't. But I don't believe it's just sound. I do believe there's context and that the context, and, I, and my own spending almost my whole adult life involved in dealing with this music, I feel like, whatever we might argue about is jazz or isn't is very much connected to how does this music have a context and a culture and not just exist as sound. 
um, even though it, if we like it, it sounds great. But yeah, I mean, so then you had to find your way as a player. Well, well let's back up before we get to that, because you just threw a lot out there. I did. <laughs> Including some complicated, thorny, controversial ideas. Yes. <laughs> I would say that the whole idea of jazz as America's true classical music is probably something that came out of the Black nationalist currents of the 60s and 70s. And then in the 80s, it got transformed into something else in the context of Reagan, the Reagan revolution and the, you know, the, the corporate revolution and the attempts to kind of beat back everything that had happened in the 60s and 70s. So, you know, jazz is America's, the new understanding of jazz is America's classical music had different overtones than the previous political overtones. You know, the musicians were fighting to get, you know, as mostly African American musicians at that time were fighting to get the respect that they felt the art form had been denied. But you have to be careful about that word respect and allied terms like the classical, because sometimes if you're trying too hard to be respected, you know, your music becomes, you don't take chances. Your music becomes flat and predictable. Um, so I think since the 1980s and 1990s, when all of that happened, you have different jazz realities, which is, kind of, you just gave the shorthand version of that. <clears throat> there are different jazz realities. The feet touch the ground in different places, so to speak, different cultural places, different social places, different identity spaces. But I think the key is the music has to reflect some cultural experience somehow. Because there's an aspect, Larry and I were talking about this before everyone arrived. There's an aspect of jazz, uh, which is like math. In other words, it's a series of formulas. You know, it's like you put out an idea and you take it through all of these sequences. So part of it is just pure mathematics. And anytime a style of music just becomes reduced to formulas, it's not really going to touch your listener. Uh, there are musicians in the history of that music who are obsessed with the mathematical aspect of jazz and could take it and make and just conjure all kinds of worlds and create all kinds of emotions. And the reason they could do that is because there was something more to what they were doing than just <clears throat> this is what you than just the music. Right. They were coming from some cultural position or some political position, or they thought that their music was in the some in the purpose of some spiritual agenda, not religious, but they were trying to convey a spiritual quality, a cultural quality, or whatever. So these are all different aspects of culture, right? People are living in the society and they're using the implements of music to interpret and digest and articulate everything that they're feeling from the horrible to the sublime. Uh, but the point is the feet are all touching the ground somewhere. And that's what gives the music the meaning and the resonance. The listener can feel that they may not understand anything about how you go from a uh, B flat minor seven chord to an E flat dominant. They don't know anything about that, but somehow they can feel that you're responding to maybe even things you read in the newspaper this morning or the dominant issues in society. So we're saying the same thing in two different ways. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. And I wasn't, yeah, when you're talking about commenting on what's going on, mm -hmm. I remember the first Gulf War, the first Gulf War, George, the first Bush presidency. His photo's right up there. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and this was before constant online and cable news. And so we weren't quite sure what was going on. It was confusing and disorienting. And I went to hear Wayne Shorter at the Blue Note, great saxophonist Wayne Shorter. And he kept dropping things in um, little bits of America the Beautiful, little bits of When Johnny Comes Marching Home, little bits of Star Wars. It was just dropping this stuff in. If you didn't pay attention closely, you wouldn't have caught it. It wasn't like a funny quote. And I was like, all right, this is actually the most sensible thing. I've, I've been watching CNN all day. This is more sensible. But that was my thing at that moment. But I did want to say, I'm going to go off on a whole but That was ironic. Um, His quotes were ironic. Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know if when Johnny comes marching home was ironic. It might have been um, tragic. 
Um, well, we'd have to ask Wayne. Um, and if you ever talk to Wayne that. Shorter, well, see people, good luck, people would say that, but I, I've talked to Wayne Shorter a lot of times. And my theory about Wayne Shorter is if you interview Wayne Shorter and then you play it back and transcribe it as I've had to do in my work, I'll find that he actually is answering all the questions, not in the order that I answered them. That I asked. <laughs> um, so I wasn't. I have an asterisk to that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, no, no. Do it now. Well, well, I mean, so Wayne is someone who speaks in very oblique terms, lots of metaphors and parables and everything. But and I, I don't want to make the move heavy. But it just so happens that I was interviewing Wayne for a book that I finished recently. The day my dad passed away, this was in 2011. It, it just was a conjunction of events, you know? So I thought to myself, oh man, I'm like, oh, I gotta go do this, you know, dealing with this and I've got to do this interview thing, you know, but it's hard to get him. Right. So I had to get him. So I got him on the phone. And actually he said, yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your dad. You know? And then we actually had an hour long conversation about, I mean, it was like a heart to heart conversation. It wasn't, abstract and oblique and anything like that. So he's actually a guy that if you, you know, as you said, if you get him from the right angle, you're gonna get a heartfelt, connected conversation. I mean, he said some really beautiful, profound things to me that day. But if you pick up a jazz magazine and read an interview with him, the interview will ask him a question and you'll read the answer and you'll be like, what, what is he well, talking about? You know, why doesn't he answer the question? That writer may not be equipped yeah, yeah, to deal yeah, yeah. with him. Yeah. I mean, you know, I had the great luxury of getting to know Ornette Coleman a little bit. And if you yeah. don't know Ornette, you know, I'm not here to tell you what you should listen to. But <laughs> if you don't know Ornette Coleman's music, listening to it will present you with a different idea of how to be a musician and an American than any other musician would give you, I say. And people would say Ornette even further out, but Ornette interviewing him was like, you come home, just, and he answered the questions you should have asked instead of the ones you did ask for me. But in real time, it would seem like what's he saying. But I want to go back to, I wasn't just trying to drop bombs and present um, some controversy. There was this, I think for a while, when I was a young man, there was this uptown versus downtown, coat and tie versus loose, quote unquote, jazz, jazz wars. and. I think mean, people who are actually involved in the culture as opposed to the business around it knew that that was sort of phony. But in the end, the jazz wars ended because people realized that there weren't really spoils worth fighting for. Anyway. <laughs> so I feel like those are off in the distance. But why I did bring that up is it kind of sent me on this search. In you know, I, I do a certain amount of our you know, I might review your album. And even in reviewing an album, I feel like it's not my job to tell you good or bad, buy or don't, although I'm going to share how I feel about it, but to convey something deeper about what is this music, where does it fit, what's it saying, what could it be saying. But then there's a lot of other writing I do, which is more about the musician, which again, isn't just about their personality, but hopefully telling a story. Hopefully I'm telling stories that are about a culture, about a musician, also maybe about where I stand in all of this. But um, for me, those phony schisms and those existential dilemmas set me off on roads. Well, actually I find myself living in a world now where questions like, well, we're living in a very strange time where the notion of classical music is suddenly blown open in this country in a way that it has never finally been, been blown finally <laughs> been as George Lewis, who was a, who wrote the book about the AACM and was an AACM member, as George Lewis would put it, decolonized. Classical music is now being decolonized. And I think we're living in a time where the idea of what is an, an American or what does it mean to be American has always been subject to interrogation. But I think now we're living in a very particular moment of let's really dig into maybe explode that. And for me, the best 
information and preparation for those things that I've had in my life is my life in this music and all the related musics. Mm -hmm. And for me, I've had this incredible luxury where I get to really talk to these people, not just call them on the phone for one little article. And this is how I've, I've what I've learned about social justice, mm -hmm. what I've learned about social conscience, what I've learned about intellectualism and how you can actually apply it outside of a subject, what I've learned about spiritual searches, I have learned through, I believe, mm -hmm. is this culture, yeah. which doesn't really matter if you don't like late Miles Davis, but you like early Miles Davis. Yeah. That, we can argue about that, and I'll say it's all good. But but um, take my course, you'll end up liking all of it. <laughs> right. And to me, you know, it is, I noticed that the book that isn't out yet concerns Miles Davis and John Coltrane. But wait, I don't want to wait. Let's wait, not go there because you can get, we can go there, but hey. I, I love what you just said because, um, you know, how a sound can kind of calibrate you for existing in society. And, and so improvisational music is something that you have to, you know, a lot of people don't like it because it's not giving you a lot of answers. It's giving you a few answers, but it's mostly questions. It's mostly a process of exploration. And so that's a particular psychological and emotional and philosophical and existential orientation towards society. Like how you wanna feel in the world. Do you wanna feel the world as, you know, as an experience in which everything is stable and the answers are there for you? And all you have to do, like the dots have already been connected and all you have to do is color in between the dots? Or do you want to experience the world as kind of wide open and you decide your, where, where your own dots are, you know, which can change from experience to experience anyway. So I think on a, on a synaptic level, like listening to improvisational jazz prepares you in a way that Larry was alluding to, it prepares you for that kind of experience of life. It prepares you to experience life as an adventure and as something that's open-ended and something that you can kind of derive your conclusions by improvising your way through life. You've got some stable reference points and a lot of it's improvisation. So, I, so that can lead you to in certain political directions and et cetera. So I, don't I, 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 wanna, I wanna take that even maybe a step further or, or at least expand on that idea about improvisation because I mean, on the one hand, there's improvisation. And OK, so like I played basketball my whole life. I'm not playing for a month or so because I broke my finger. But I'm playing my whole life. And you know, there are these much younger guys that I'll sometimes play. And this guy, he is doing things with the ball that I could never do in my life. But I'm standing there. OK, when are you going to attempt to score or do anything for your team rather than just that sure. model improvisation. Yeah. And really, when you play the game, there's this unbelievable real time, everyone's improvising, yet working with form. Yeah. Everyone's, everyone is also has some kind of knowledge or empathy or sensitivity to everyone else's styles. Now, to me, this is, this is like basic, basic, and I don't want to caricature by saying, but there's that level of Okay, now you're performing in a society, but that's, we've heard these things about a jazz ensemble before. I also don't want to glamorize or over glamorize the idea of the improviser. Where I came to much later in my life, only through talking to musicians and hard work or thinking is where jazz has led, you know, when I started working and writing about jazz, people didn't talk about Charles Mingus as a composer. People, maybe Ellington, maybe. People didn't talk about jazz, certain jazz musicians as a composer. People definitely didn't talk about um, things that sounded too improvised as a composition. And again, we're in this interesting moment where even the conservatory trained musicians who until very recently were essentially told, you might improvise, but don't do that here. That's like an extra thing you might want to try to do, but we don't want to talk. And I'm well, we're that, still dealing with that here again. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yet there is there is definitely a generation or more of classically trained musicians who now can deal. 
But the idea that the jazz musicians and jazz composers and very hip classical composers and composers of many traditions around the world have led me to understand this. It's not composition here and improvisation here. It's not composition versus improvisation. These two things are part of a whole. They relate to each other. They really do relate to each other. At a certain point, it gets silly. You know, it's important to look at the score and know what was on the page. But the truth of composition and improvisation is much subtler and more complicated. And if you really enter the world of the world of the jazz musicians like Alan Lowe, who's sitting there, you will understand that 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 is a truth. And I think that's a truth that's translatable to like you were saying, everyday life and politics. Um, it's not, and you know, to me, the those subtleties, the other subtlety that jazz and music of other cultures, especially African diasporan cultures, but really almost every culture other than the European classical and American pop culture, is that life is polyrhythmic. Life is polyrhythmic. You don't have to think about it's only one rhythm and any other rhythm is contrapuntal. Mm -hmm. Does not have to be a colonial situation of dominance of rhythm. You might write in one rhythm, you might play in one rhythm, but life is polyrhythmic, which, you know, and that is a truth. It, you know, if you enter the world of just of jazz drummers, that world is so intellectually and physically complicated. And each drummer is so specific. If you really look at what they're doing, I mean, we could spend an hour talking about Elvin Jones and what he did with a beat, right? Absolutely. And it would be different than Art Blakey. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, so to me, these are subtleties that they exist in all great music, but the culture that I think we're talking about demands this. You know, you can find great literature you can find great writing almost anywhere, but what we would say is real literature and forget real. What we would say is a culture of literature that we want to be invested in demands a certain nuance and sophistication <laughs> of writing. This, it's not even like a skill level. It demands a level, what I would call jazz culture demands a level of nuance, of empathy, of understanding. It doesn't mean you have to, the player is necessarily a good person, but it does mean that they are able to enter into something that is more than just playing at someone else. Well, a lot of times you're getting the best of the person through their music. That's like their highest aspiration as human being. So thank God we have that, right? Because a lot of people could be bastards in life or not contributing to art and culture. But I want to go back and just clarify. So when I use this term improvisation, I mean, we know that in, in the jazz discourse that people say that composition is slowed down improvisation, improvisation is sped up composition. So these are relative terms. But look, a lot of people, for example, who like to go hear concerts of Western classical music, and they only want to hear the classics, you know, stuff from the classical period, maybe a little romantic music, Baroque, you know. And these pieces are programmed year after year after year. Or you could be into pop music you know, and you want to hear your favorite songs. And so you just program, you know, your, your listening device, whatever it is, just so you can hear your favorite songs, right? So then you're kind of, it's, it's a habitual pleasure response that you're getting. Uh, the music that's improvised, it's not going to give you that immediate pleasure, but you, it'll still give you pleasure, but it's a more stretched out, expanded kind of pleasure response. So, for example, if I want, and I love pop music too. So, you, you know, sometimes I look at my, well, they don't have uh, iTunes anymore. Now it's called something else. I don't know. I got my new computer. It's just called music, Apple Music. I don't know why they had to, but anyway, <laughs> well, I had to do away with that. It was very useful for me. So, I could go to my playlist count and I say, man, this song on here I've listened to 172 times or 500, you know, I mean, over a period of years. There are obviously some stable reference points, things that I listen to. And so it's not really improvisation, even if it's something that's a two hour long improvisation. If you listen to it 150 times, it's not really spontaneous for you anymore. You've just stretched your pleasure response out 
for you know a span of two hours. But I think for the average person who's used to music being a consistent thing that they go to for quick pleasure, because not many people have two hours to listen to a piece of music. Most people are experiencing music a little differently. Um, and those who are able to, as you say, kind of uh, adapt to improvisational music, it's going to create a different experience of music for them over the long and short term, I would say. So I, I hear you. But that's, you bring up a very interesting point that comes up in a lot of conversations I have with different musicians and people in the world of music, which is <clears throat> the pressure to innovate mm -hmm. or the pressure to play. Hey, I, you know, I don't, if someone in the middle of their very adventurous set just plays a blues <clears throat> and then people are like applauding, oh, that's blues, I recognize that I'm going to applaud. I don't, I don't have a problem with that if they can play, if they're capable of playing blues, but and then even in the classical world now, in some contemporary classical new music circles, there's this idea that you must be innovating. I actually really love hearing, you know, Whitney Ballia, who used to write about jazz for The New Yorker, used the phrase, the sound of surprise, and it's been quoted a million times. It's a good line. Um, and I, I don't, I actually really like the sound. I like to hear something that I haven't heard before. I like to hear a color in music that I haven't heard before. I like to hear the first time I heard the music of Henry Threadgill, mm -hmm. who got a Pulitzer for composition several years ago. I felt like, OK, this person is somehow <laughs> manipulating rhythm in a way that I have not heard before, and I don't quite know how it works. So that's intriguing to me. Some people don't like. Some people want to eat the same thing every night. Some people don't want a new flavor. but I do feel like the culture that we're talking about almost always does both. So yeah. if you go deeply into Henry Threadgill's music, which is, sorry, he's been doing what he's been doing for a while. So maybe some people might not say it's cutting edge, but he's doing something innovative. But at the same time, he is deeply invested in some ideas of ritual that go back to the beginning of jazz or before. And I want to go on and on about that. You can agree or disagree about that one example. But the David Vareles, who we were playing right before we started talking, Cuban pianist to what he's doing, I would say, is very advanced and modern, modernistic in one way. But at the same time, is leaning on Afro-Cuban ritual rhythms that predate jazz, or at least, you know, we're talking about so that's another one for me is, I think, now, now can I say Miles and Coltrane and the fact that you have a book that deals with them? Yeah, but you keep raising these interesting points. I know. But <laughs> I'm connected. No, I'm not asking about the book. I'm just yeah. saying Miles and Coltrane, and there are many musicians who do these sorts of things, but such gigantic figures, to me, what's very interesting is that in each case, you have fans of each of these musicians who set a marker, I don't like anything after this date. I won't listen to anything Miles did after a certain year in 1960s. Mm -hmm. I won't, I definitely won't listen to anything Coltrane did after 1964. So my book goes to those places. Right, right. <laughs> so, all right, see, now we can't talk about it. Um, um, okay. But I mean, I mean, to me, what, what the, the, the message I got from, from those musicians is, don't call it, if you try to say it's one thing, you're wrong. It's, it can be, we can have multiple ideas and multiple identities. We can hold more than one time at one moment. We can hold more than one thought at one moment. We can be moving forward and backward at the same moment. And I think most of the art that we appreciate either does that or did that at some point. Um, Those are musicians of today. When I was college age, it was a very different and you alluded to this period. I was in music school in the 80s. And then there were very definitely musicians who were on this side of the coin or that side of the coin, you know, and they rarely crossed. So now today, it's like we're in the 2020s, the whole thing has been blown wide open. All the staple categories have been blown open, and jazz has responded to that. But in the 80s, 
it was mm -hmm. in a whole different situation, you know? So, I mean, there were people who were losing friends by showing up with a particular album. You know, I, know, <laughs> I had a friend who came in with a late Coltrane album, said, hey, fellas, looking at him, was like, oh no, you can't do it anymore. <laughs> he was instantly excommunicated. Uh, not by me, but by some people I knew, you know? So, um, it, I, I think it's, it's wide open now, actually. So you're saying now, you only lose friends if you show up with Kenny G. <laughs> and even that will be, it'll lead to interesting conversations and maybe a documentary. Um, we have a class to go to Kenny G in my survey this semester. Um, Does he in New Haven? He lives in New Haven? He did. Woo! <laughs> I mean, so we're going to go by his house, we're going to give him a, a standing ovation, we're going to picket the house, and what are we going to do? <laughs> Throw it. <laughs> He's smart, see, that's why he's rich. He doesn't live in New York City. He decided to move out of this expensive city. I mean, you notice that in all this talk, we've been, all this conversation, we haven't talked that much about styles and this style, that style, this name, that name. Even, I mean, at a certain point, you know, we could spend the entire time talking about the history of this word jazz, where it came from, what it might mean, who, um, but I don't, I don't think we want to do that. But I, I have been really interested, like I guess at a university, you can use the word problematize. The, the name jazz and the word jazz is very problematized. And I think that area is really interesting with not to necessarily talk about the word, but to think about all the areas of there where, it's, where it's problematic and what that signifies. And you know, I, I, I gave a lecture at a college, and then the student came to me afterwards and said, she said, I'm doing a paper on Ethiopian jazz, and I want to talk to you, because she knew that I also had a background in quote unquote world music. And, and there is some very interesting, very distinct Ethiopian jazz. In fact, there's, and um, she wanted to talk to me about where it fit into jazz or world music, or, and I was like, well, back up a second think why don't you think about each of those terms and why those terms might be used and i do find that most of the time when you've got terms there is a history of someone who wants to name own and possibly sell yeah. and once you're and the interesting thing about this moment also is that the business that used to name own and possibly sell the music made by quote unquote jazz musicians that business is blown to pieces. They don't have a business model. If you can come up with a business model, do it because you will get very wealthy and be a hero to musicians. Right now, the only business model that's going is large corporations that really just want your data and they want to buy and sell the data and yeah. they care nothing about music. They also care nothing about whether my writing is on their website. So that's that may sound terrible, but that's also a wildly liberating reality. Well, yeah, right, because the other business model is DIY, DIY, because musicians selling their own music through websites, streaming, or whatever. But I mean, we touch on this in the in the class, you know, this word jazz. Like, why do we still use that word? And what I tell the class is, <clears throat> jazz was the name given to America's dominant popular dance music in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, maybe you know, inching into the early 50s. So there was a lot of money to be made, and the business model consolidated around that. But shortly after that, the whole thing blew open. I mean, blew open with Charlie Parker and the Beboppers. That wasn't money-making music. That was a very hermetic, abstract subculture. So from, I don't know, the end of, the, of World War II on, even though there were ebbs and flows, I mean, people talked about 1959 as a year that all these jazz, great, you know, canonical, Jazz recordings were released like Kind of Blue and Mink Asylum and so on and so on, and Brubeck's Time Out. But really, there's no way that something like that, that music as diverse as, say, Miles' Kind of Blue, uh, Louis Armstrong's Hot Fives and Hot Sevens, uh, Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, John Coltrane, Alice Coltrane, Henry Threadgill, Anthony Braxton, Wynton Marsalis, David Vrelis. There's no way that one term can possibly encompass all of this stylistic 
variation and all the different aims and objectives that these musicians have for their music. The only reason we still use that J word is because it's the word that consolidated in that historical moment when, you know, around that sound, swing and big band music, when there was a lot of capital being pumped through the J word. Ever since the 1950s, it's been hotly, frag uh, hotly contested, super fragmented, and the, the, the industry is just trying to keep that J word going so they can try to squeeze as much juice out of that withered fruit as they can. But in fact, that J word hasn't been able to accompany, uh, encompass everything since the ni late 1940s. Yeah. I'm sorry, I've seen, uh, in 1905 newspaper clip, uh, a reference to a, a jazz band playing in a baseball game. So it goes way back. The early, the early New Orleans guys called themselves jazz players and jazzers. I mean, my problem with what you're saying, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, is that well, what I'm saying. Or well, what, what, what you said, but I mean, in terms of the disagree about it, encompassing is because we've used nothing but the term here jazz today, and we all understand it means Threadgill, it means Miles Davis, <clears throat> it means Ellington, it means Benny Goodman, it means Gil Evans. I mean, I think the term is actually pretty inclusive in its own strangely evolved way. I don't know. Well, this is the term we have, so we're yeah. using it. Yeah. <laughs> it. Yeah, and I don't, I mean, as I was saying before, I I think it's it's better to look at what ideas, controversies, examinations of the word would lead you to. So like, I feel like, yes, jazz isn't a term I want to throw away, but I want to wear it like a very loose garment. And um, yeah, the, according to Lewis Porter, a very good historian and musician, and you can go to the WBGO website and find his wonderful account of the etymology of jazz. And its first printed use was in connection with baseball. And it meant something having to do with energy. There's also enough evidence where people at a certain point started associating jazz, J-A-S-S, with sexuality. And so it, it, it's a very muddled history, but it is a term. Now, I've been in enough conferences and meetings of people who have very good intention and love the same music I love, who wring their hands over, oh my God, jazz used to be this much of the market and now it's 3%. Oh my God, why can it be like when Ramsey Lewis could have a hit on the radio with a jazz song? And that world is over. You would not recreate that world. So it's foolish to think about it. Also, oh my God, they're not paying the proper respect to jazz or they're paying too much respect to jazz and now it's gonna turn it into a museum piece. These are all trite comments and worries. Actually, some of the most innovative work that I do like this only involves panels and people performing is at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. It's just a matter of, well, what do you want your museum to be like? Do you want to turn it into, you know, I, I know some performing arts institutions that are like museums in the way they choose to pre present music. But it's just, well, what, we're in this very interesting moment, I think, where we're all questioning every single word that is connected with any kind of identity. It's a very productive process. So jazz can be one of those words. And I think that if you really want to think about, well, how and why are someone using the word jazz and what, where does it fit? You're going to naturally be on very productive roads that lead you to what is the story of race in this country? What is the story of art and music as related to commerce? What is, where does the life of the, at least decades ago, mostly black improvising musicians who came out of certain traditions where did that fit with the rest of music as it is in this country? And then you'll be down this other road, which is how can you not go outside the bounds of this country? Tracing back the diaspora through the Caribbean, through Cuba to West Africa, and then seeing connections in a wider world. The most interesting jazz recording that I heard lately is by Rajna Swaminathan, who plays a South a South Indian drum, two-headed drum called is it Radunga. Radunga? Radunga, yeah. Um and I mean I, this is jazz. Um and she's playing with musicians who I know as jazz musicians. That's not 
I went, ooh, that's not fusing jazz with world music. That's not a new combination of American and Indian rhythms. This is just the natural course of events. It's just natural connections. And I found that in my political life and my personal life, I can move forward into a new context without leaving the history of who I am and who my father was and who my community was when I was young. They don't have to be in conflict. And I think the story that we end up telling about this culture prepares us for that. It's, there, is, there is a jazz history that involves some of the names we said, and that is a very valuable history is undeniable. It's undeniable that you know, each of the musicians we mentioned, Sonny Rollins, certain people did certain things that are in a lineage of jazz, and that is worth knowing if you grew up in this country and worth knowing if you care about music. It doesn't mean that it defines how you see the function of this music or even what jazz culture is. Well, the, the, I agree with you. I mean, there are periods of time in which people have said jazz is this and is not that. Blah blah blah. Um, there, you know, go back three decades, and there were people who would think, oh, fusing jazz with Indian music, Indian classical music, that's not jazz. That's not really jazz, you know, because jazz is X, Y, and Z. <clears throat> there's a reason that jazz musicians, there's a history of of that intersection between jazz and Indian music. And it's because the Indian classical traditions, Hindustani music and Carnatic music, they are improvisation based. They're, they're based on thematic improvisation. Uh, might not be chord changes in the Western harmon harmony system, but it's basically a type of thematic improvisation, rags and ragas and tals and, and tals, complicated rhythmic cycles, complicated rhythmic cycles and all of that. So there's a reason that the jazz musicians gravitated towards the Indian class, certain jazz musicians gravitated towards the Indian classical traditions, and that that's like a substream of music, which is maintained over time. You know, it's it's not a coincidence. And we're just at a, a place today in which we can embrace it and celebrate it as opposed to where we might have been in the 1980s and 90s when, you know, people were fighting about whether that was even valid as jazz, even though people have been doing it since the 40s. It's been like an Indo jazz intersection going back to the late 1940s. You, we were earlier. I wasn't alive we, then. Before we start, that was me. Before we started, almost, before we started talking, we were talking about Randy Weston, yeah. great, um, the late great pianist and just a great human being. Um, and at one point, he was working with a Chinese pipa player named Min Chao Fen and collaborating with her. And he was telling me about how, first of all, I talked to her and she told me when she first came to the States and started encountering him, he told her to listen to monk music, the monk's music. Yeah, that same quality to it. No, she yeah. thought he meant music of Buddhist monks. She didn't know who Thelonious <laughs> Monk was. Yeah. And then he told me that they would went and did research together in libraries about connections between certain African sounds and African musical lineages and ones in China and that they were advancing something that they thought had very clear historic. Now, whatever they came up with and whatever its factual basis is, you know, this wasn't, they weren't trying to fuse their musics. They were looking for something. They, they found the connection between the languages they spoke and they felt that there was something deeper there. And I do, you know, I don't mean to be sound preachy, but I do feel like a lot of the stuff that I don't know. After this has nothing to do with where you stand politically. But after Donald Trump was elected, I was part of these marches that were out in the street, and there were so many people out in the street. It was very impressive. But I found myself like there are a whole lot of people talking about a whole lot of different things here. They're not all talking about the same thing. And I kind of was like, ever since then, I've been trying to reconcile. Well, how do all these different ideas and agendas and missions? Um, get connected and I or at least these lives get connected and I feel like in my life online in my social and political life they don't get connected I think people like to 
whatever, divisive, whatever. I feel like the culture that that this breeds and build the music builds on, you know, I'm not saying, oh, it's for the good of humanity. I'm just saying it's a natural expression of creativity and artistry and personal connections and working together in real time that simply force the crossing of those things, not because it's a good thing to do, not because there's a political imperative, but because the, the music itself and the creation <laughs> of the music itself just does it. Sometimes it takes the arrival of a dictator to force everyone else to see how much common ground they actually share. Yeah. I just, um, this is an observation from a complete lay person, but one who's married to a jazz musician. Uh, a trait that I have noticed with uh, Alan and with other jazz musicians that I've listened to and had conversations with is the trait of curiosity. I'm glad you said and that. I've often wondered, do curious people get drawn to jazz? Or is there something about improvisation that opens the mind up to be more curious? I don't, it's, maybe it's not an answer to that, but it's just something I've noticed that you hadn't mentioned with, or way earlier, you were talking about different traits involved in this. And I think curiosity is a big one. Uh, no, that's a, a great, that's a great word and a great point. And that's an interesting question. And I would say both. I would say both. I don't know. Um, I'd also say that, I don't know, it, it is a truth that jazz musicians, well, first of all, a short funny story. So um, <laughs> a short funny story is um, a record producer brought the saxophonist Pharaoh Sanders to Morocco to play with the great Ganawa Sufi Muslim Ganawa masters. And he told them, here, I'm bringing you this jazz musician and I think you two will play well together. And the Sufi master was like, he said, no, 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 he's an improviser. And I was like, okay, come on, okay, we can do this now. And actually they played pretty well together. But I have found the truth that jazz musicians tend to be able to play with great musicians wherever they go from whatever tradition. And I feel like this is a tradition that connects to the curiosity of the, the, mo the great open curious business. open yeah. musician. I mean, there's a certain aptitude a jazz musician can handle more rhythmic schemes or something that falls outside of certain chordal structures or ideas of harmony. But I think you nailed, this is the real point of connection. That I am, yeah. You yeah, have someone had a hand up back there. Oh, well, before you go, before you jump, I just want to give you guys a quick time check. Uh -oh. um, you might want to switch to the Q and A. It sounds like people. Oh, we are. are. Oh, yeah. we're. Yeah. Oh, we're there. Want to. Oh no, thinking. we're there. We're there. <laughs> we're there. Yeah, hi. I'm also a, a lay person. I'm a <laughs> person that does not play an instrument. Uh, but so yeah, it's kind of you bring an interesting point about like you know like making improvisation with an essential part of like being like jazz, right? Or what we're gonna call jazz, right? But maybe it's this ability to to cross boundaries and be open. I mean that seems to be the a, a, yes. a, 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 a overriding like ethos, right? And within this kind of music that we're gonna call jazz, right? That right. that people are willing and open to, and to a larger community of musicians and ideas. Yeah. Do you want to speak Sorry, to Sorry well just not that we talk about jazz as the classic music. The key thing guys to remember, I think, is that improvisation is an aspect of African American music that goes back to the 1800s. Um, it's it's sort of a, it's a norm in African American culture and slave culture. And afterwards, you know, they have no instruments. So they got to figure out what they're going to play. You know, if you go back to jug bands in the 1920s, there's a whole major like a washboard things like that. But it's also improvising. It's some of it is a question of social status. You know, of, of African Americans who are enslaved or or discriminated against. But it's also the nature of the culture itself. You know, in, in other words, it's, it's, it's as you said, it's post diasporic, it's, it's probably a trait of Africa. There's a, a, a theory that says, and I agree with it, is that white people are as affected by Africa as, as black people are. And I think a lot of uh, musician, white musicians resist this for various political reasons that are more complicated than we could probably spend the whole other day on. But I think as, you, as soon as you realize that, you know, you realize that it's, it's a cultural thing, it's not just a jazz thing. You know, well, the music historically 
And the, the history of America distorts this reality. But the history of that music is, is a fusion in and of itself. Yeah. It's a fusion of the Western European musical system and the West African musical system. But because of the history of slavery in this country, the Africanist component has not been articulated and explicated. And then a lot of those, um, and that, that's not only because of slavery, it's because in West Africa, a lot of those musical traditions were not notated musical traditions, mm -hmm. except maybe in the, Arab, the areas where Arabic was spoken. And, and, and that was a relatively small, those were relatively, a relatively small percentage of the source cultures of the Africans who were brought to the United States. So I would say that improvisation is central to all of the Sub-Saharan African traditions. It's, it's not only a function of impoverishment or you know a lack of something, it's actually a core conceptual, a core compositional practice of all of the African traditions, including those that travel to not only the United States, but the Caribbean, Latin America, South America, Central America, et cetera. Anywhere you go, whether people of African descent, they're going to be improvising somehow. They're going to be using improvisation as a core compositional technique, whether they're rapping, whether they're playing musical instruments, whether they're dancing, whether they're speaking, whether they're boxing, you know, whether they're joking around. It's, it's just a core expressive element of all African derived cultures. So it's not something that only arose because of the particular circumstances in the United States. And in fact, the history of jazz and the concepts and the philosophy of jazz will never be profoundly understood until we can understand that Africanist component that has flown into it. It's, uh, yeah, historically as 50% as or maybe more than 50% of you know the, the the information out of which that music was created. All of these, what Alan and Michael are saying are, are deep truths. Um, and there's a lot to that in that, all right, we could say that bebop maybe moved jazz away from a popular danceable music. But my experience with the music and with the musicians is that, first of all, this has never, what they call jazz and what they call that black musical tradition, what they call that African-American musical tradition is never removed from dance or some effect in bodily movement and never removed from some element of ritual that at least implies some spiritual quest or consequence. But while you're talking about this stuff, there's this other history where Chopin earned his keep <clears throat> by improvising at the piano for rich people. So there is this, there was a, a, a eradication campaign in that other culture to make improvisation a foreign and alien thing when in fact it wasn't. But yeah, openness, you said openness back there. That's, that's been my experience, especially with the oldest musicians I know. They are open, every now and then you meet an elder and you're really touched by how, just how open they are. They're open to whatever's in your phone or whatever, you know, is going on. But these are people that are not just open to the idea. They want to use it because they're curious because they want, it's, it's and I don't think it's to keep current. I don't think it's to seem relevant. I think it's because this is an on, you know, how can it, 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 how is this a sponge? I mean, but I think, almost all artistic pursuits, creative pursuits will take on, most of the artists and the brilliant people I've met, to my surprise, turned out to be very, very diligent and organized in their own way, and turned out to be completely open to all kinds of ideas, even if their paintings look exactly the same each time. And that's definitely so, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned openness. Yeah. As a Part of this conversation, the saxophonist Gary Bartz is deeply offended by the expression improvisation because <clears throat> he said it, it implies crazy. that it's on the whim or off the top of your head. And he said it's spontaneous composition and it requires a mastery to be able to compose spontaneously. Yeah. No, <laughs> I mean, Gary Bartz is a brilliant musician. He's also very articulate about <laughs> the politics of race in this country. And yes. some of his earlier albums expressed that. 
um, you know, he's dealing, there's a political agenda to someone saying jazz is classical music, America's classical music, and there's a political agenda to fighting for certain respect and rights and saying it's not improvisation, it's spontaneous composition. But I actually think if I was Gary Bartz and his age and lived his life, I would hold fast to that too. But I think there's a level of let's get beyond needing to call something classical music. Let's get beyond needing to call spontaneous improvisation, spontaneous composition, so you will respect it properly. Just understand that these things, composition and improvisation are equal, interrelated, and just like light and shadow. Well, that's a bad example. I don't want to use that They're interrelated. That's a good example. Yeah, it isn't. Well, let's say yin and yang. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you make a really good point there. I also, at least in my experience, I feel like improvisation sort of inherently rejects a lot of hierarchical power structures and like prearranged notions of what music should be like do you agree with that and do you think that might have a connection with sort of the inherent politicalness and politics of jazz wait agree with what just sort of the idea that improvisation is inherently a rejection of certain <clears throat> types of power structures That's a complicated one. I will tell you that William Parker, a great bassist and a great, he is a great bassist, a great bassist and a real figurehead of a certain community in New York City. Um, he has talked to me a lot about improvisation as a political act, not just that it is inherently a political act. And yeah, you can look at it that way. Um, then again, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, a composed piece, well, I mean, the fear over that is complicated. It had to do with a publicist, but, but that is composition as a, that had the effect of a political act. So you can fight the hierarchy or, you know, try to have some, incite some revolution through improvisation or through composition. Um, sometimes I wonder, and that's the question I'll ask you, because you're a player. Can instrumental music, or so John Coltrane's quartet at the Vanguard, or Nitz Coleman's band at the Five Spot, just the sound of that instrumental music it made people angry, or they had a visceral response. Can instrumental music do that today? Or maybe, actually, you, you, I would want to know what you people think too. Can instrumental music, apart from what words are being said, can it do that today? I mean, someone younger than us. Oh, well, yeah, in the back, so we've got a vigorous head beyond. Yeah, I think you can. <laughs> I mean, just from personal experience. That, look, give me, can you give us some examples? I, 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 I make a point of not remembering the back. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something sometimes it's just preposterous, and you know, yeah. the composer can't find it good. And, uh, and I think, like, sometimes I think a computer can write better music than something I listen to. I mean, I don't listen to them on purpose, but uh, something, yeah, I would say, yeah, some music is just preposterous. Just, but it, it'll, it's, it'll it's get that kind of reaction from you just because of its sound. Uh -huh. Okay, I see. I got a death threat once after a certain recording I made, which had heavy, heavy political content, and it was actually <laughs> one of the musicians on the uh, session uh, threatened me and then apologized later. So it, it definitely does have a sort of emotional. Uh, emotional ability to uh, when translate from music into politics. Yeah, so, um, so... But do we learn to sort of like the things that we built? Because I came of age in the 80s listening to jazz, and so the term jazz got in the way of getting to Threadgill and Blake Coltrane. Yeah. And so, so eventually, though, listening to classical music like Stravinsky and other things, like, opened me up to actually grow into that. So I don't, I, I, I really, as old as I, I try not to like pigeonhole music into, except for maybe Kenny G. But, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's hard to say that, that, that you know, at the, when it first erupts into you, it becomes this like disrupted element and you have to deal with it, right? And it's how you deal with it that can be the political action, right? You've got to, it's all at call, arms or like you shy away from it. At least that's the, the way I think it's. Well, the music is just a set of symbolic codes yeah. that use sound as its medium. And so if you reconfigure the codes, if you reconfigure previously familiar codes, 
you're going to unsettle and upset people. And then people will come habituated to that, and then someone else will come along and scramble the codes. But then there's another angle, which is the intention of the of the musician, of the performer. So why is a musician performing? Like what what are they doing this for? And my feeling is that musicians have a job in society, which is to use sound to sensitize us to the world around us, continually recalibrate our sensitivities, and also to stoke the life energy in listeners. You know, you're supposed to feel enlivened and awoken and energized, I think. This is just my own subjective opinion um, by encountering a piece of music. If it's, if there's music that, you know, we can use to lull us to sleep also. There's a place for that. And all kinds of music, but generally we're using this medium of sound to waken people's bodies and spirits up so that they have a richer sensory experience of the world. That's what I would say. Did you were speaking to me? Yeah, I actually, actually had a, a sort of a different question. Um, so I don't want to take on this. No, no, ask. Me. Yeah, um, so you guys work in sort of like two different mediums of jazz. Um, you know, you're more in academia, you work in um, sort of news and uh, writing. Um, and you've talked about it, we've sort of been talking about it this whole conversation. There's a really rich history of jazz where um, it had a big place in American culture. You know, if you're in New York, there's a jazz bar like every few streets, and you know, that's not the reality now. Um, maybe not every few streets, but you know, there, there was a, a much bigger presence. Um, how do you feel that like in both of your spaces, uh, the sort of like fight to maintain jazz and like keep its prominence has been? And like, you know, Yale, for example, has a big history of kind of letting jazz go to the wayside and how have you seen it from your perspectives? Well, I exist in Yale, but I also exist as a musician in New York City. So I have a dual career and a dual life. And um, from my position, the music is very open and flexible now, but it needs to still be in dialogue with, it needs to be brought down to the street level. It needs to be in dialogue with the streets and the things going on around us on a daily basis and a momentary basis. That doesn't mean it's popular music or popular dance music or whatever. It just means we have to get a sense that that music is responding to the world that we experience all, you know, every day, as opposed to this classicized idea of jazz that you've got to learn standards and you've got to play this and you can't play until you've digested blah, 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 blah. That's one thing that has provided continuity in the history of music, but it's also in this period killing the music, I think, because if we, you know, the music has got to be digest the world that we live in. And if we, if we don't feel that it's responsive to that, then it's not going to resonate with us. That's my short answer. I'm, I'm really glad you asked those questions. And um, I mean, sometimes it can seem that the academic, and I'm not I'm talking about your life here at Yale and not your life as a musician, and the critic or a journalist, which is what I am, live in separate spheres. And they are sometimes secluded, but I think this conversation oh, in in my in my experience, the people like us who are doing it aren't, but I don't think there's the kind of connection there might be. But okay, the last time I went to a conference of like industry professionals and musicians and presenters, this was I haven't gone to one in a very long time. I just walked in this one meeting, I said, I have one word to say, community, and then I left. And that's I mean I literally did that. Did they pay you for that? No, I wasn't being paid. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I talk more when I'm being paid. But but um but uh no, I really meant it. And if you look into any of the histories that we have made reference to, or probably any of the histories or stories of any music you like, period, you will find that there are communities of people, and a lot of the music that we're talking about grew out of places that had neighborhood venues that were accessible and affordable to people. And maybe this person isn't a musician, but they were important to that room. If you Google my name and New Orleans, you'll see a lot of writing. Some of it isn't behind the evil Wall Street Journal paywall. And about post-Katrina New Orleans, where yes, these musicians, these brass band musicians came back. What happens when they come back and their neighborhood yeah. will not be reconstituted? And forgetting about the civil rights, social justice aspects of that story, what are the cultural 
implications of that because then this is you know what is necessary so i would say you know it's community yeah. um this is a community what we're doing right now as well and you all have um, have certain lives some of them may be online or through your phone that create certain forms of community and that's cool but how can you it, it, it is a connect a person to person connection that forms a community yeah. that really sustains more so than anyone's business plan. And Absolutely. one thing I've written also if you Googled my name and Cuba, you say I've written these pieces about the connections between American and Cuban musicians. So for my entire life, the US has officially had an embargo related to Cuba. Now they've been, depending on who is president, the ability to go back and forth is different, but there was an intense, intense connection community formed by Americans and Cubans, especially in New Orleans, but also in New York. And that community was effectively cut off. There's been plenty of good music, plenty of good collaborations, but we'll never know what would have happened in the past 60 years were it not for that. You know, that and and New Orleans now. I don't know, any of you see the David Simon show Treme? So that's about a neighborhood. Um, that neighborhood was torn asunder by the devastation of the levee failures, but now is being destroyed more by things like Airbnb. Gentrification. And, and, but a, a sinister version of it yeah. that happens really fast and insidiously. And however you feel about property rights and Airbnb or whatever, it's just literally the community that gave rise to the Dirty Dozen Brass Band or even to the basis of Terrence Blanchard's career will not exist. And, and all right, can you form another community that can foster something like that? So, I mean, if you wanna think about the hit, you know, what will help support these kinds of art forms, if you think more in terms of people in community, rather, I mean, still have to have a good business plan for your album, but that's the key, I think. And, you know, that, that was a good question. Well, I would say you have to kind of, at some point, get to the politics of it, too. Um, again, not to turn towards the dark side, but we, we are living in the aftermath of certain, uh, several waves of devastation that destroyed inner city communities where jazz historically thrived. Even this city here, believe it or not, used to be a major jazz hub. All the jazz music, I mean, from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, maybe even to the early 80s, there were all the musicians that were traveling back and forth between the major markets of Boston and New York stopped off and played a night or two in New Haven. So you go up Dixwell Avenue today, for example, that's where most of those clubs were in Dixwell, some were in Whaley, there was some downtown New Haven. All the great jazz musicians played those clubs on a regular basis. So you could see someone like Miles or Coltrane or Duke Ellington in New Haven in those decades. But you would never know that today because in the aftermath of crack, even you know, the crack wars of 1980s and 90s, and the devastation that that brought on these communities, you know, the economic devastation, many institutions were destroyed all the way down to the level of venues. So you would never even imagine that something like that existed in New Haven. You know what I mean? Parents don't even want to send their kids to New Haven because they, they think, well, it's kind of a rough city. And, you know, Every week we're getting these bulletins on the email that someone was shot at with BBs or had a, you know, had a paint gun, paintball, you know, so it's like, but that's all post apocalypse in <laughs> Haven. That's, and, and, and so you kind of have to put it in political perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, when you think about stuff like <clears throat> problems with education in certain cities, my son goes to a New York City public school. The answer is usually, put money into these, don't try to solve the school problem, try to solve the problem of communities. Mm -hmm. If you want to, what happens, you know, promising young jazz musician, hey, now they'll get to play performing arts centers, maybe Yale, maybe universities. Are there accessible neighborhood ways for them to make music around a community of people and for that community to be able to hear them? I do, I'm pretty sure we're gonna have to stop soon, so I, I just, and the one thing I do, I would feel remiss in not raising is as we're talking about all these openings up and these upheavals of past prejudices or, <laughs> or um, structures, um, 
the history of whatever we call jazz is definitely a patriarchal, male-dominated um, succession of great men history. And to take nothing away from any of those great artists and those great men, we are definitely living in a moment in general, but definitely in the jazz community and the community of people who present, pay for, talk about jazz, where that is being rethought, not just in terms, on the <laughs> one hand, it creates opportunity for female players and composers, but it also opens the door to a history that was always there of someone like Mary Lou Williams and what she accomplished, not just as a musician, but as a mentor and the creator of a small community that included who, people who went on to be very famous innovators or even Lil Hardin Armstrong and what her role was at a certain moment, not only in Louis Armstrong's career, but in general, or someone like Jerry Allen, who died too young, but was about my age, and to me was one of the great musicians of my, the towering musicians of my generation. And I wish I would have, she would have lived to see where that would have went. So I'm just pointing that out because it's not actually the, that moment of change is here. And you know, the same way I talked about my own experience of jazz moving forward and backward at the same time. We now have the experience of empowerment or opportunity that used to be denied moving forward, but also able to look back and notice things that were staring right. Carla Blay, <coughs> she well, did a lot of stuff. Ironically, it's places like this, spaces like this, academia has you know created, a, especially when you think about the gender angle on jazz, the old ways that you only you could only learn by on the job training. Right. You had to go out on the road and you know go to the clubs and hang out in the nightclubs and blah blah blah. And so that was kind of a a space that not a lot of women want to inhabit. But you know something like university jazz education, you know the broadening jazz pedagogy, it's opened up spaces for a lot of people who wouldn't have wanted to you know participate according to the older system. Like Jerry Allen, for example, is someone who's a highly educated jazz musician. It's tragic that she passed away because she, I mean, but the amount of amazing music that she's left behind is incredible. And she played here once years ago. Um, so Jerry Allen is actually uh, a manifestation of like what could happen in the university setting and how it opened up a, a portal for greater participation for women, Alice Coltrane is another person. I mean, we can go on down the line and talk okay. about all these amazing jazz women, Michelle Rose women we talked about earlier. Who else did we mention? Uh, I mean, these are people who are, for the most part, performing now. Um, so it's 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 an amazing time in that sense. And I don't think those women would have been able to rise to prominence as easily if there hadn't been spaces like academia where they could learn their craft without having to, you know, go out there and kind of duke it out in the nocturnal world of the floating world of the jazz clubs, which, you know, frankly, not even all male musicians want to participate in that culture. Some people just want to play and go home, you know, <laughs> but now there's this whole thing that you got to hang, you got to, the gig ends at 12 o'clock, you got to hang until three in the morning. Who has time to do that when they've got kids or they've got a job or whatever? So that in that sense, because sometimes music and academia are in two entirely different spheres. I think the musicians and the journalists are much closer together, which is why we're able to have a, an easy conversation and we're pretty much on the same page according to every issue. But if it were like a straight down the line jazz academic and a journalist or a straight down the line jazz academic and a musician, it might be, <laughs> the pieces might not fit together so so easily. So um, that's the, the beautiful part of spaces like this. What we can do. I think this is the moment where the set needs to end, right? I was going to say that I can't imagine a more beautiful the set way to end. to end to talk about <laughs> the possibilities of what the university space could offer in terms of creative music Absolutely. and community making, um, which is something we pride ourselves on trying to do in this place like a residential college. So. Um, yeah, thank you. So thank can you. we just thank our wonderful uh, No, thank you.
you so much and thank you, Michael, for taking up my invitation. Um, and you know, so the thing about Mary Lou Williams is she had this Harlem parlor and she would invite young Thelonious Monk, Bud Powell, young Billy Taylor, other musicians in the way they describe it, she would teach them how to touch the piano, but it was much bigger and this is, and it was her home. So you are Mary Lou tonight. <laughs> today. Oh, well, what an honor. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a big honor. And yeah. I gotta thank you and everyone at the collective, which to me, the collective is a, this is a very tangible example of what I'm talking about by community, which regardless of what's in the university curriculum, there's a, there's a presence of jazz here through a community. That's very cool. Um, Eva and the others know how to reach me. So now we're part of a community and please reach out to me anytime for anything, music I should hear, something you want to know, good joke. Did you get on your mailing list too? Oh, and if you, if you email, tell Eva or email me, then I'll send you emails with things I'm doing and stuff that you won't have to go through a paywall to get. That's it's true too. Yeah. But really, it's more about communication. So thank you. I'm very honored and happy to be here.